Um, I'm going to introduce our presenters by their uh, institutions. Carolyn Chen from Northwestern University, talking about accidental pilgrims, imperialism, migration, and religion among contemporary Taiwanese and Korean Christian immigrants in the United States. Then comes Manuel Vasquez from the University of Florida, talking about faith-based organizations, transnational immigration, and the new panopticon. Then Jacqueline Hagen from the University of North Carolina, speaking on migration miracle, faith, hope, and meaning on the undocumented journeys. And finally, for closing, Albert Waku from Florida International University on Haluka's struggles, Haitian migration, Haitian migrants, and voodoo practice in Miami. Uh, again, it's gonna be 10 minutes for each one of the speakers. Uh, if you want and agree, I will remind you first when you have, what, four minutes left? Three minutes left, what do you prefer? Three. Three minutes left, then again when you have two minutes left, and then when you have one minute left. So look this way every once in a while, I'll try to put the sign over here so that you finish on time and we have uh, equal time for all. So um, I am Ato Maduro uh, from Drew University Theological School, uh, president of the American Academy of Religion for a few more hours. And um, welcome then to all of you. And uh, Carolyn Chen will be our first uh, presenter. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Maduro, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It's a great honor. One of the most striking things about Korean and Taiwanese migration to the United States since 1965 is the dramatic change in the proportion of Christians. In Taiwan, Christians are 4.9% of the population. But in the United States, Christians make up roughly 25% of, pop of the Taiwanese American population. People are often surprised to hear that Korean Americans, of whom 71% are Christian, come from a country that is 33% Christian. Today, I would like to set the Christianization of Taiwanese and Korean immigrants to the United States in the context of American imperialism. I argue that the Christianization of Korean and Taiwanese immigrants in the US is an unintended consequence of American foreign and immigration policies that were formulated during the Cold War. I will discuss how American imperialism has shaped the religions of Taiwanese immigrants, a community that I have studied intensively, and will reflect on its similarities and differences with Korean immigrant religion. Let me first offer a provocative suggestion about immigration patterns from the Asian American scholar Yen Lei Espiritu. Explaining Filipino migration to the US, Espiritu writes, we came to, quote, we came to the US because the US first came to us, end quote. Espiritu suggests that it is American imperialism and not the American dream, which uproots populations and sets migrants in motion. American involvement in East Asia after 1945 was shaped by an overriding imperative to contain communism in China and the Korean Peninsula. In the decade following World War II, Korean and China were each embroiled in civil wars that resulted in two Koreas and two Chinas, one communist and one free. The US invest, invested billions of dollars in providing military defense and building the economies of South Korea and Taiwan, reasoning that robust capitalist economies would be less likely to fall to communism. American policymakers may have been right about that, and both countries surely welcomed American aid in rebuilding themselves after 50 years of Japanese colonialism and years of ruinous war. But the East Asian mir miracle, as Taiwan and South, Korea rapid, South Korea's rapid economic rise has been called, also came at great cost. Rapid industrialization and urbanization caused major rural to urban internal migration, overcrowding in cities, extreme competition for scarce resources, and severe pollution. The situation was even more dire in South Korea due to the mass migration of Koreans from the north to the south because of the war. 
Add to these conditions the corruption and human rights abuses of the U.S.-backed military dictatorships of Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan and Park Chung-hee in South Korea, and the conditions were ripe for a mass exodus. Now, wanting to leave is one thing, but being allowed to come is something entirely different. Since the liberalization of immigration policy in 1965, the U.S. has given highest priority to two kinds of applicants. A, highly skilled and educated professionals, especially scientists, and B, family members of American citizens. Highly educated professionals, it was believed, would help the U.S. win the Cold War. The effect of these policies on countries like Taiwan and South Korea has been to pull significant numbers of people from the educated urban middle classes, and the U.S. is the most desirable and popular destination. Those who can afford to leave come here to the United States. Now, let me return to religion. Part of the reason why there is such a disparity in the number of Christians among Koreans and Taiwanese in Asia compared to the United States has to do with who can come and who make, migrates first. Both, as I've argued, are byproducts of a particular moment in the history of American imperialism. First, let me establish that because of American immigration policies, the early waves of immigration from both Taiwan and Korea swept up the young, urban educated elite, people who happened to be disproportionately Christian. These early Christian immigrants in the 1960s and 70s laid the groundwork for the Christianization of later, gen of later immigrants. Their churches became critical institutions in the community and are now one of the first institutions that new immigrants will interact with, regardless of religious affiliation. Now I'd like to give you an example of how American immigration policies that we have seen favor the highly educated and family members of US citizens shape the predilection for Christian conversion among Taiwanese immigrants. For would-be Taiwanese immigrants, the process usually begins with a young and highly educated member of the family who comes to the United States alone or with his spouse and children to study or to work as a skilled professional through an H-1B visa. Typically, the highly educated Taiwanese immigrant is religiously unattached. This is important because in Taiwan, the highly educated are also the least religious. Now, because this Taiwanese immigrant has neither religious nor kin attachments in the U.S., he is very open to the community he finds in the ethnic church, one of the most prominent institutions in the ethnic community. He converts. Once he gains citizenship, he sponsors his other family members. They move close to him and become integrated into American society through his church and Christian networks. Less educated immigrants face different pressures than their more than their than their more educated brothers. They cannot transfer their skills to the US, so they start a small business. But the pattern is similar. For them, it is even more important to belong to a Christian community, to establish a network of suppliers and clients, and to develop a reputation as an honest business person. His family members convert. This pattern of chain family migration leads to chain religious conversion. This pattern is similar for some Korean immigrants, but there are also some important differences that may explain why a greater proportion of Korean Christians, excuse me, why a greater proportion of Korean Americans are Christian. Korea has more Christians, and a higher fraction of Korea's immigrant stream is Christian. Furthermore, the correlation between religiosity and education in Korea is exactly the opposite of Taiwan. The educated, who are more likely to migrate, are also the mo more re most religious. So half of Korean immigrants interviewed within a year of their arrival already identify as Christian. And the church plays an even more important role economically for, for more Korean immigrants, of whom an even larger share are small business owners compared to Taiwanese. I would like to close my talk today by returning to the idea that immigration is a byproduct of imperialism. Immigrants come to the United States because the United States first came to, comes to them. And although both American immigration policy and American foreign policy in East Asia are neutral toward religion, these policies have had dramatic religious consequences for immigrants. 
One group of immigrants is composed of people who are Christian in their home countries and were pulled disproportionately into a stream of US-bound immigration by a particular configuration of Cold War era policies. The other group consists of those who convert during the immigration process. I call these two groups accidental pilgrims. Their story helps explain the distinctively Christian character of the East Asian experience in the US. They migrate for reasons that have to do with this world economic opportunity and political security. But along the way, for a variety of contingent, historically policy reasons, their journey takes on otherworldly dimensions and becomes, for many, a journey of faith, a pilgrimage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Otto Maduro, for organizing this very timely panel and for inviting me to contribute my voice to the panel. Let me start by saying that the recent elections give us some reasons to be optimistic. The overwhelming support that President Obama received from African Americans, Latinos, Asian, and Asian Americans made a big difference. Whether we will see a comprehensive immigration reform in the near future is an open question. However, these elections have made one thing clear. America is becoming more diverse, and our political leaders will find it increasingly difficult to use simplistic and polarizing language to deal with the human dilemmas posed by unauthorized immigration. We thus have a unique opportunity now to redirect the conversation on immigration away from derogatory labels and counterproductive piecemeal approaches and to move instead to our coherent uh, immig immigration system that reflects America's evolving identity and her place in the world. So following Foucault, I would prefer to adopt uh, an attitude of, quote, hyperactive pessimism. <laughs> he tells us that, quote, the point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous. And if everything is dangerous, we always have something to do. Like Foucault, I think it is important to cultivate an ethos of permanent critique because if there, even if there were uh, Im uh, comprehensive immigration reform, it is very likely to include a strong component of enforcement. And we already see the positioning of Senator Lindsey Graham, for example, saying that if we're going to have immigration reform, we need to have our borders under control. So, and these last few years have been years of enforcement. Despite the recent overture to the dreamers, the Obama administration has been doubling down on enforcement as a way to prove that it, it's get tough policy uh, credentials on immigration. As of July, 12th, uh, as July 2012, the Obama administration had deported 1.4 million uh, immigrants, unauthorized immigrants, largely through the uh, informant, enforcement efforts of secure communities, which is a program that um, we can talk some more about it. I don't have time to go into it. ICE removal averaged 400,000 annually, and that's compared to 250,000 during the Bush administration. But the duress has not only come at the federal level. State and, lo and localities have been taking matters into their own hands, formulating and passing a myriad of laws aimed at disciplining and punishing unauthorized immigrants. Just in 2009, for example, 1,500 uh, immigration-related laws and resolutions were considered in 50 state, state legislatures, with 353 ultimately enacted. According to Monica Varsiani, these laws range from, quote, those that penalize employers for knowingly employing, uh, employing um, illegal immigrants to laws preventing undocumented immigrants from receiving uh, driver's licenses to laws excluding undocumented students from in-state benefits and public colleges, at, at public colleges. Other local ordinances prohibit uh, landlords from renting to unauthorized immigrants or even limit the number of renters per housing unit. And as we know, uh, SB 1070 is the most well-known law, uh, but there are other laws throughout uh, the, the country, such as Alabama HB 56, which is arguably the most draconian of these laws. Like SB 1070, HB 56 requires employers to use e-verify 
to check employees' immigration status and deputizes the police to check the status of anyone uh, uh, they stop if they suspect that the person is in the country without proper authorization. However, Alabama uh, goes further than SB 1070 by ordering um, public elementary, middle, and high schools to ascertain the immigration status of students upon, upon enrollment and report the number of unauthorized immigrants to state education officials. Furthermore, it, criminal, it criminalizes the act of harboring, transporting, or assisting undocumented immigrants. HB 56 had had a dramatic effect on Alabama's unauthorized immigrant community. In a panic, many parents have taken their children, many of them US citizens, out of schools and fled with their meager belongings to other states such as Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. According to the pastor of St. Margaret's of Scotland Church, a church with a large Latino congregation, he says, quote, this is the saddest thing I have experienced in my 18 years as a priest. We already have lost 20% of our congregation in, la in the past few weeks, and more will be gone by next week. It is a human tragedy. When uh, State Representative Mickey Hammond was asked about the goal behind HB 56, which he co-sponsored, he stated that the law was intended to, quote, attack every aspect of an illegal alien's life so that they will deport themselves. This strategy that goes by the euphemism of self-deportation or the more technocratic and bloodless attrition through enforcement, both of which appeared at, at the presidential de uh, debate, makes us hear something, uh, the echoes of what uh, Giorgio Agamben calls the notion of homo sacer, the accursed men stripped of any rights and reduced to bare life. The focus on enforcement goes, has gone hand in hand with a strong emphasis on detention. According to the Detention Watch Network, quote, in 2001, the US detained um, 95,000 individuals. By uh, 2009, the number of individuals detained annually grew to 380,000. This despite the fact that overall crime rates are down. The daily average population of detained immigrants has ballooned from 5,000 uh, in 1994 to 19,000 in 2001 to 30,000 in 2009. So we have about 350 detention facilities throughout the United States run by giant corporations such as Corrections Corporations of America, CCA, or the GEO Group, and uh, MTC. These facilities are operated at an annual cost to the taxpayer of $1.7 billion, with private corp corporations receiving from Homeland Security an average of $122 per day for each immigrant they hold. So they have an incentive to have more immigrants to hold because they get a certain amount per head. So even uh, with the drop of crime and the protract protracted economic crisis notwithstanding, it, but for 2010, CCA and GEO reported an annual, annual profits of $1.7 billion respectively, each of them, right? So, so much money uh, leads to uh, they uh, going lobbying um, uh, state officials. As a matter of fact, uh, for those of you, we can talk some more. There's a connection between SB 1070 in Arizona and the uh, CCA. They, they actually uh, contributed to drafting the law. So how do we explain this phenomena? Uh, perhaps we can begin to find the answer to this question on, uh, in Foucault's lectures on governmentality at the Collège de France, where he identified the rise of, power, of a new power over life, what he calls anatomopolitics, that simultaneously involves, first, the seizure of power over the body of a, in an individualizing mode, and second, the seizure of power that is not individualizing but massifying. In order to ensure the, the spatial distribution of individual bodies, their separation, their alignment, serialization, surveillance, and organization around those individuals of a whole field of visibility. For Foucault, uh, biopolitics are, are, are central to this, to this idea. Um, since I'm, I'm running out of time, let me just say basically that what we have here is what I call a new transnational panopticon that is basically interested in rendering visible
the figure of the immigrant, of the other, right? Um, and using these technologies of power, um, technologies of power that regulate mobility, belonging, and it's no longer the, the militarization and securitization of the borders, but the application of a new set of biometric technologies, including uh, secure communities, which allow for data mining and for the deployment of what I would call a nanophysics beyond the microphysics of power that Foucault talked about, that penetrates at the, to the deepest capillaries of everyday life with far gra finer gra granulation and more pervasive reach than the microphysics that Foucault described. And we can talk some more about that. This is what Agamben called as the danger of the state of exception becoming the rule in our liberal democracies. So what is the role of religion quickly in this? I believe that this is a complex, complex question, but I believe that my research, in addition with the research of scholars in the religion and immigration group, by the way, there's a handout that's running around there, shows that the congregations of faith-based organizations can offer alternative forms of visibility, not the tyranny of the, the gaze of the state, a different kind of presencing without papers, building of Jacques Derrida's work on unconditional hospitality, and Emmanuel Levinas on the ir irreducibility of the enfleshed other we, uh, that we encounter face to face. We may say that congregations have opened themselves, that congregations who have opened themselves, that have opened themselves to the risk, surprise, and promises of welcoming the immigrants, regardless of their status, are, however precariously, serving as incubators of a new ethics, not simply of com cosmopolitanism, but of singularity, of full recognition of the other, not as the, the faceless threat that needs to be kept at bay, controlled and punished, not as the other whose subjecthood is exhausted by the contingent logic of the na neoliberal um, nation state, but as a complex self, self whose existence is inextricably bound with ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jacqueline. Great. Good morning, and thank you for um, thank you for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to begin my talk with the experience of a Mexican immigrant, Cecilia, who traveled to the United States from her hometown of Puebla, Mexico, with her husband and sister when she was 19 years of age. Before leaving on what she suspected would be a dangerous journey, the women sought the blessing of their priest, and on the day of her departure. Cecilia's mother lit candles next to the statue of La Virgen de Guadalupe on the altar in their home. The departing trio then flew to Tijuana, where they met a coyote who drove them to an undisclosed area in the desert, joining more migrants and another coyote. The men headed on foot towards the border, while the women and children, who had paid an additional sum for extra protection, were crammed into the back of a sealed van. We were suffocating, Cecilia told me. I prayed in silence to God to let me live. After several hours, the driver stopped, released the group, gave them water and cookies, and told them to wait for the second vehicle who would take them to the States. Before it arrived, a group of SUVs approached from the distance. The coyote rushed everyone to another area several hundred feet away, explaining that these were dangerous drug smugglers. You see, Cecilia explained to me, the coyotes were paying them to use the area. They told us to turn our backs and that if we dared to turn around, we would be shot. The woman next to me did turn around and saw that the men were carrying bazookas. The group recited quietly prayers on the backs of the holy cards of La Virgen de Guadalupe. When the coyotes finally guided the women across the border, Cecilia found her husband and already had found that he'd already arrived without incident. So clearly, the additional protection they had purchased did not guarantee a less dangerous journey. Reunited, the migrants fell to their knees and gave thanks to La Virgen de Guadalupe. Cecilia then called her mother, who also knelt and gave thanks, then blew out the two white candles with the Virgin's image that had illuminated her daughter's path to safety in the United States. Each year, thousands of unauthorized migrants from Central America and Mexico come to the United States in search of work. And each year, hundreds die along the way. In their desperate attempts, 
they must overcome a host of legal, social, and physical problems, forced to travel by foot and in poorly ventilated vehicles over thousands of miles across deserts, mountains, rivers, and several heavily guarded international borders. To be sure, unauthorized entry into the United States has always been a dangerous event and sometimes fatal. However, in recent decades, with the militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border and the rise of a migration industry that preys on poor migrants, the journey has required more risks than ever before. My comments today focus on an unexplored dimension of the undocumented migration undertaking, the powerful influence of religion. To date, the historic and contemporary scholarship on the relationship between religion and migration has largely focused on how religion helps migrants adapt in a new land. In my own research, based on hundreds of interviews with undocumented migrants and religious uh, leaders in the region, I have found that there is far more to the importance of immigrants' religious faith than just whether or not it aids in their civic and social adaptation. It also structures the migration undertaking and the journey. For many, their religion assists them with the decision to migrate, and it fortifies them to prepare psychologically for the hardships of the journey. Some simply pray for safety and fortitude. Others wait for a sign or a message from God indicating that their migration plans may move forward. The very religious may even postpone trips until they receive these messages. And these religious signs could take many forms, from a scripture reading, to endorsement of migration by a family member, to securing a coyote or even a visa. Signs are important not only because people believe in them, but because they are powerful agents of action, in this, in this case influencing the timing of migration. Religion is also a guiding and supporting force at the stage of leave-taking. Migrants turn to their trusted clergy for counsel and approval. And final blessings offer enormous psychological empowerment to prospective migrants. These official blessings constitute a spiritual travel per permit that in the eyes of many receivers may come close to, if not exceed, the value of an official passport or visa. Migration counseling then sanctions what is otherwise an unauthorized act. And let me just interject very quickly here. Um, a Scalabrini priest told me a charming story of a group of migrants that had come to him for a final blessing. And he reluctantly he gave it, and the group went on its way, and they were eventually caught in Houston and returned. And three days later, the priest received a call from the group, and they asked for another blessing. So they arrived at the church, and the priest said, well, why would you come for another blessing? Obviously, it didn't help very much. And they said, we beg to differ with you, Father. We wouldn't have made it as far as Houston without your blessing. <laughs> um, in any event, so migrants and families are also active agents in leave-taking, as the case of Cecilia showed, practicing, reproducing, and transforming popular religious, religious rituals so that the icons, icons can guide and accompany migrants on their journeys and travelers remain close connected to homeland and family. Um, religion also reveals itself throughout the undocumented journey itself. Right, migration from Latin America has largely been conceptualized as a social process in which migrants rely undocumented on kin and family to help them um, um, reach the United States. But the changing conditions of the dangerous journey have resulted in the growth of religious and humanitarian organizations that provide for transit migrants. So basically, migrants lacking resources and personal networks now turn to churches to perform these network functions. In essence, these organizations have become part of the social infrastructure that sustains transit migration in the region. Faith-based shelters are especially important in structuring the northbound journey providing numerous services to migrants, including food, shelter, clothing, medical assistance. They also receive spiritual, psychological, and social capital for their journey. Religious organizations along the migrant trail have also become advocates for the rights of migrants. 
So at multiple levels of church hierarchy, from binational bishops' conferences to interfaith organizations and to small churches throughout the region, faith workers are increasingly involved in issues of human rights and transit migration. Motivated by a theology of migration advocacy for the rights of migrants and the right to cross borders and find work, these religious workers and the transnational hierarchies in which they operate have emerged as an important public actor in the monitoring and contesting of state regulatory policies and practices. Yet migrants are not always able to find sanctuary on the road. In order to understand how they cope with despair and danger outside of institutional walls, we need to shift attention away from the mediating role of religion and move to what Orsi and others call the everyday religion, how they find meaning and um, with the religious um, idioms available to them. Undocumented migrants do indeed live religion on the road, both as a means to survive and a way to find meaning on the journey. They turn to the familiar and reproduce, borrow, and create cultural and religious practices to help them survive migration. As some migrants told me, their faith was their sustenance during the journey, and their relationship with their icons was strongest then when they were stripped of all resources. After arriving in the United States, migrants continued to draw on familiar cultural practices, believing that their faith actually made migration happen. In return for protection and safe passage, they were determined to fulfill their promises to God, to a virgin, or to saints. These devotional rituals manifested themselves over time through multiple activities. Some observed them in a home altar, others entered a church on their knees, and still others sent home ex votos to their pastors. My research illustrates the powerful and reflexive role of religion in decision making, the journey, and the arrival. Religion does not explain why people migrate, nor directly does it determine whether they succeed. Yet as a guiding, coping, protective, and mediating force, it does shape how the migrants form their decisions, how they decided on the timing of their departures, how they experienced their journey, and ultimately how they made sense of their place in the migration process. And for some, their faith did in fact fortify them with the willpower to persevere and ultimately reach the United States. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Professor Maduro, for inviting me to share my research, my ongoing research on uh, voodoo in Miami with the group. A post-colonial critical perspective questioning persistent understandings and usages of the construct religion views the construct as an outcome of contested meanings. So their creators are inherently, their creations are inherently political processes. They represent elite perspectives on what is legitimate religion. Sociologist Meredith Maguire, for example, questions the fixed boundaries implied by the usage religion, boundaries which allow us to define some experiences as religious and others as non-religious. Not only are these boundaries social constructions, she argues, they are also ethnocentric and they use imperial religious experiences as the baseline for comparison with other religious expressions. What is deemed religious and what is not then is not a function of, it's a, it's a function of who has the power to define and impose definitions. In other words, when it comes to the question of what religion is, the Sabbatan cannot speak. Experiences that do not fit neatly into religion as we have learned to picture it, beg adjectives. The power to define religion lies not with those whose religion begs such adjectives or calls for the use of labels. Now using these ideas as my main point of departure, I shed light on the rise and fall of Haluba, a homeful or worship place in Haitian voodoo, and a botanica, which is a shop where ritual paraphernalia is often bought. 
in Miami's Little Haiti. Founded in 1994 as a response to the insecurities that accompanied the lives of some Haitian migrants in South Florida, fleeing from the turmoil that overt and covert interventions of the USA have created in their homeland, Haluba was a testament to the peaceful, constructive ways in which Haitian migrants are creating, living, and transforming voodoo amid and despite imperial understandings and policies. The story of its rise and fall epitomizes the struggle of its creators, whose lives as migrants living under forms of imperial duress are no less disrupted than the lives of those they left behind in Haiti. I argue that the public prejudice against Haitian migrants and voodoo in Miami aside, a gap between the imperial and subaltern understandings of what voodoo is, is at the heart of the issues defining Haluba's struggle for survival. While views from below share an understanding of voodoo as a complex of beliefs and ritual techniques that exist as an integral component of Haitian culture, the imperial construct of voodoo as a religion imposed on it from colonial times is proving to be its undoing in the Miamian portion of its North American home. Voodoo, sorry, viewed as a tangible, given, pre-existing established religious institution with clear, fixed boundaries that supposedly enables us to grasp and distinguish its beliefs and practices from other aspects of indigenous Haitian culture or its practitioners from those who are not or to identify those who convert to or from voodoo, Haitian voodoo is an imperial construct. When some practitioners describe their practices in terms of religion, they do so because they have absorbed the colonial language about religion, as happened in most post-colonial contexts. For, in spite of this superficial language, in-depth conversations with them will reveal that they indeed tend to avoid the voodoo, non-voodoo religious dichotomy. Voodoo has such an extensive cultural reach that it would seem to be a distortion to identify it merely as a religion. Rather than speak about a religion called voodoo, those who serve the lowest, as worshippers are called, often explain that they serve their spirits, a reference to their working with a complex pantheon of divinities who both shape and reflect their world. For these worshippers, what we might refer to as religion essentially is about supernatural assistance in tackling problems located in all departments of life as best as one can. Among the ethnic groups that will contribute religious habitus to create the cultural complex that the empires called voodoo, there was no way of detecting a religion before European empires forced such concepts on them in colonial experiments. In Fong and Ewe usages, the construct of voodoo means a spirit or a god. And in earlier stages of the colonial era in Haiti, voodoo originally referred to a single modality of drumming and ritualizing among many others. It was empire, outsiders, who first applied the word voodoo as a specific reference to the entire complex and beliefs in Haiti, complex of cultural uh, actions and beliefs in Haiti. The fetish trope established in the European intellectual discourse by the 1800s as a result of the intellectual, political, and economic interaction between Europe and Africa is another imperial construct. This construct provides the most pervasive and broadly influential rationale for imperial cultural chauvinism and prejudice against voodoo. Until 4th, October 12, 20, 12, Haluba Humfo was a testimony of Voodoo's emerging triumph in a long struggle for public visibility in Miami. Reminiscent of its colonial past, Voodoo in Miami has largely been an undergrad, an undergrad cultural practice. Not only are those who serve the lowest reluctant to admit in public their involvement, concrete evidence of Voodoo practice is kept carefully within the privacy of homes, lest they attract the attention of neighbors who might complain or even call the police to interrupt rituals. It was the frequent interruption of such rituals that prompted Papa Paul, a hunger from Jackmel in Haiti to create Haluba in Little Haiti in 1994. 
Ray and Stapik describe Haiti's religious landscape, little Haiti's religious landscape, as a forest with roots in Haiti, whose fruits nourish the religious needs of Haitian trans migrants in Miami. Haluba was one of the spaces in the empire in which these migrants harvested these fruits. The bulk of them arrive in Miami in boats and rafts in the 1970s, on more from their villages in Haiti's countryside by internal disruptions linked to schemes for Haiti orchestrated by the US Department, USAID, the World Bank, or the CIA. And they were forced northwards, only to encounter a hostile context of reception in their new homes. Because as poor, recent, mostly undocumented, dark-skinned and non-English speaking people, they were on the wrong side of the empire's power, power balance. Many of them talk at length about their, their racist attitudes, the discrimination and humiliation they still experience, and how these have engendered feelings of worthlessness in them. Many are exploited on the job market, and the constant fear of being of deportation is part and parcel of the daily lives of those who are yet to secure their green cards. It is to the essential needs of these immigrants that the voodoo spirits who incarnate during Haluba's rituals responded. But Haluba also furnished forms of social capital, likewise critical, of critical importance to surviving and getting ahead. This was a safe heaven for most of these Haitians. Haluba was also a space for performing counter-imperial resistance through rituals such as the Kanzo, an initiation ritual, which introduces American-born Haitians to the African roots and the Haitian history, enabling them to construct and perform a distinct black identity, which is Haitian, and in the process, reject the racial categories in which the empire locates all black people born within it. Such was the high value placed on Haluba that when the community reeling under the effects of the national unemployment and financial crisis could no longer afford the rents, Ingrid, the key mambo in charge, treated the rescue of Haluba as a matter of urgency, paying out of her own pocket. Thus far, her attempt to find a less expensive place for Haluba has failed. On a day after a lengthy discussion with the high-ranking officials of the city after, about the possibility of using a part of the newly created and underused Haitian Cultural Center for voodoo rituals, she called me and sounding very defeated. And she explained, I could not bash them. I don't know whether they have anything against voodoo. What I know is that we are on opposite sides of a divide. They are only seeing voodoo as a religion and arguing that the cultural center cannot be used for voodoo rituals. But we, who serve the law, do not see religion. What we see is a whole culture, a whole way of life, for whose expression this cultural center was created. Like Ingrid, most respondents use the contrast religion when making references to their tradition. What we do is voodoo culture, they explain. Haluba has not found a new home yet. Meanwhile, the practitioners have gone underground once more. In casting Haluba's crisis in these terms, English seems to relocate it not only in the popular prejudices against Haitian migrants, but also in the gap that exists between the elite constructions of voodoo and perspectives from below. What these voices below are led us to is the need to rethink voodoo as a religion beyond the interests and the constraints of the empire and reputable religious institutions, and to ponder the ethical implications of the constructs we impose over the practices of newly arriving immigrants in the USA. Thank you. I want to thank our four speakers very, very much for their papers. I would ask them actually to email a copy of your papers to me if you want, and we might talk about the possibility of a publication 
uh, together in the near future. We have 15 minutes left only, so what I will ask you is that those of you who have questions or remarks for our speakers, that you go to that uh, microphone over there. It was over there. I don't see it now. It's still here. Okay. Yes. And one there, I think. And pose very briefly your remark or question. We're going to have five minutes for the audience to do that. All right. Uh, one remark and one question. The remark I have is that I think it can be very helpful for us in more established Eurocentric religions to uh, think more about this distinction of culture and religion and why we uh, hold so strictly to it and what we might gain by uh, paying more attention to culture, um, religious culture. Uh, the question I have is really for Ms. Chen, and that is, um, did you find any uh, uh, or indication that the involvement of churches in the United States in the imperial process, churches like my own Presbyterian church, uh, were part of the result of um, higher Christianization among uh, immigrants from East Asia. Thank you very much. Next, on this side. Uh, for uh, Jacqueline Hagen, I was wondering if you could describe what sort of things Pentecostal undocumented immigrants did in lieu of a prayer card or a rosary um, that you may have discovered in your research? Thank you. Another person here? Yeah, my question uh, is also for Jacqueline and perhaps uh, the other panelists. Uh, I'll be interested in the role of uh, religion for documented migrants because oftentimes there's an overemphasis on uh, the interconnection of religion with undocumented migrants. So what role is that playing for documented migrants? One here. My name is Annalisa Butici, and I work on the African Pentecostal diaspora in Italy. And many of the stories that you, you told us today remind me of the Mediterranean crossing of African migrants towards fortress Europe. Um, it's extremely uh, fascinating thinking that these churches can spiritually and socially empower this migrant. But please, how can we reconcile this when we see that many of these churches also add more pain to this migrant when they um, are not really uh, supporting them, but they are cheating on them, they are exploiting them to respond to the capitalistic need of accumulating capital. How can we recognize these two uh, different roles and how can we reconcile it as a scholars? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, one more person on this side. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to follow up on the metaphor of pilgrimage. Um, I was really fascinated because um, it seems to me that in many, um, in, in much research on postmodern forms of pilgrimage, it's a way of stepping outside of the constraints of imperialistic capitalism. And yet, uh, you described it as in some ways being in sync with the project of, the, uh, of, of imperialism. And so I wondered if you might comment on that. And then I also wondered if the, um, the, the, the migrants um, in Mexico and, and the Southwest, if they understand themselves, if they describe themselves as pilgrims, if they understand, I know, I know they use the word of migration and migrantes, but do they understand themselves also as, as pilgrims? Did you find that? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this question is for Professors uh, Vasquez and Hagen. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how uh, religious leaders and institutions are tapping into transnational advocacy networks in the United States and um, the likelihood of pressure being applied on American legislators given the growing focus on immigration as a foreign policy issue. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Hello. Uh, my question is for Dr. Waku. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, Claudine Michel and some of her writings on Haitian voodoo and uh, 
also some of the, the ways in which she writes Haitian voodoo as, or constructs Haitian voodoo as uh, monotheistic, where bon Dieu grand maître represents the supreme deity. Uh, how is it that people uh, in the Humfo in Miami actually connect with that concept of, of uh, bon Dieu or, or as, 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 as the supreme deity outside of the Western construction of Haitian voodoo as uh, having, uh, being multi-theistic, polytheistic. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Especially how do uh, Haitian Americans, Protestant Haitian Americans, connect with that concept? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask our speakers to come to the podium in the same order that they presented. And uh, unfortunately, you will have barely two minutes <laughs> for your response. So I'll remind you when one minute is left and when your time is over. So uh, Caroline, uh, come first, please. Okay, um, so in um, response to the first question about the role of missionaries um, in, um, in um, East Asia, um, yes, that was very much um, American missionaries and particularly the Presbyterian Church was very active in um, converting and, and having a very strong presence in Korea and in Taiwan, um, both as a um, in setting up schools and hospitals um, um, and, and churches. Um, so those, um, those early missionary efforts were very important in forming these Christian communities of which, as I had mentioned, it, there was a preponderance of more of the more educated Koreans and Taiwanese to convert. And then they were the, um, also the early migrants to come to the United States to uh, set up these churches, which would be critical for later migrants. Um, okay, I know I only have a few seconds left, but um, in response to the question about pilgrimage um, being in sync with imperialism, I, I don't really think that that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, migration, this particular kind of migration in the Christianization of East Asian immigrants is an unintended consequence of imperialism, of imperial, of imperial, uh, these policies. Um, and so I, I would hesitate to say that's, that it's in sync with imperialism, but it is an unintended consequence in this case. Thank you very much. Manuel? So many good questions. Um, <laughs> let me take a couple. Um, on uh, Danielle's question about Pentecostals, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure that Jackie will have something more to say about this, but uh, my own research shows that uh, Pentecostalism uses the, uh, the, uh, um, the narrative of conversion often to talk about uh, the um, idea of migrating. In other words, part, uh, part of the process of migration is a, is a tribulation that's put in the, in, the, in the path of the Christian that is seeking to, to uh, convert, and it's... Uh, Part of the uh, uh, part of the process of migrating, having a kind of a spiritual journey, so that the spiritual journey and the physical journey coincide, and there is a there is a common narrative that makes sense of that is part of the God's plan for that particular person. Uh, quickly saying saying that, uh, in terms of the exploitation of churches, this is true that um, uh, some of the literature has tended to look at uh, um, the positive role that religion place for immigrants, uh, which is very obvious, but uh, like any network, uh, uh, networks are not just about inclusion, but they're also about exclusion and exploitation. And some of the churches, particularly ethnic churches, sometimes uh, can be exploitative in the sense of uh, basically being connected to employment networks that allow for, so even I've met, I've had uh, pastors that uh, during the during the day they are a business person and, and during at night they are they are pastors and some of the members of their congregation work in, in their in his firm and he pays them uh, really uh, inferior uh, wages so so that's a that's a clear situation that we need to keep in mind as when we talk about religion but this is like any other in, uh, human institution human institutions are ambivalent we shouldn't uh, just think that religion is special about this i think any human institution is ambivalent and it behooves us as as religious scholars to look at that ambivalence clearly and finally 
on transnational uh, adv advocacy networks, this is a, much, much more work needs to be done there, but uh, there are obviously, uh, the Catholic Church, for example, has been at the forefront. Uh, the Catholic bishops uh, have produced letters such as uh, Strangers No Longer that are both in Spanish and English, and they have been very active working with the bishops in uh, Mexico to try to advance a, uh, a comprehensive immigration reform that takes into account both the right of immigrants to uh, of people to migrate in search of a, of a good life, but also the uh, the right of the, of, uh, of states to uh, control their borders. And so um, the, these uh, networks are there, but are networks that need to be developed. And this is something that uh, that uh, that I think we as scholars could um, contribute uh, by uh, by encouraging uh, organizations not to just work at the local level, where uh, congregations do do quite a bit of work, but also to work uh, transnationally because immigration is a trans national dilemma. Thank you very much. Jacqueline. Okay, um, let me see, a few moments. The question on the, the different religious practices of Protestants and Catholics is a very interesting one. I actually had a page here, but he cut me off. Um, <laughs> in any event, what I found was in the preparation for the journey, um, there were very clear differences so that uh, Protestants often attended prayer camps, retreats, Ayunos, um, where they would f fast beforehand and then pray for several days and they would receive migration counseling as such, whereas Catholics would go more to formal pr pilgrimages, go to shrines and um, request uh, protection and safety from specific saints. But on the road, I found there was an, an, uh, quite a bit of syncretism, that is whatever idioms were available. So it was very common to see a Protestant carrying a uh, devotional for migrants that was handed out by a church um, and similarly, um, that Protestants and Catholics would be praying together very often. So it really was about what was available, and there was a lot of movement across um, religious practices, and I think that's been found by a number of scholars um, as well. Um, the other question, which I think was really interesting, is the undocumented documented divide, and how real is that? Um, in my, my own research, I, I did interview um, uh, 100 documented migrants and um, decided to make the story about the undocumented journey, but found that yes, there was a lot of religious practices as well, numerous stories of people, you know, saying the rosary three times on the plane trip to the United States, you know, uh, different types of fears approaching, whether they would be able to get into the country once they got off that plane or, or the fear of the unknown, et cetera, it was there. It was just really at a different level. Um, and of course, the, the journey itself, um, there wasn't as much complexity in the religious practices. I'm gonna, oh, I've got another minute. Um, let's see, the transnational networks, I think you kind of addressed that. Um, I spent some time with the Tex-Mex bishops, as they call themselves, and, um, and uh, listened to their stories and narratives and their approaches to trying to develop these transnational networks. The Scalabrini is a fantastic example of um, a sanctuary network that has grown um, throughout Central America and Mexico and into the United States that provides for transit migrants and is very effective in um, helping buffer the journey, prepare them for dangers ahead, and provide for alternative routes, and to try to withstand the coyote industry, which preys often at these places. And finally, the question of um, the exploitive nature of the church. This is interesting, and I'm just gonna give one comment here, is in Mexico, the um, migration the departure is big business, and the bishops have made quite a bit of money and the diocese on this. So at any church, you will find a little store next to it that sells migration devotionals, and um, they've, they've, they've recreated saints as coyote saints. Um, there's a big business around it, but the migrants don't mind. I mean, in that sense, they don't mind. They buy right into it. And there, you know, there's a demand supply. And Sorry. Thank you. Um, to the question about um, the ways in which the practitioners characterize Bondi, um, monotheism and polytheism are, are not uh, um, categories that most of these lay practitioners really uh, subscribe to. They are more concerned about the day-to-day -day issues, mundane issues, and how lawyers, you know, can uh, help them to resolve those issues. 
if you press them hard in very uh, long and lengthy conversations, the sense you get is that um, Bonde is God, even though the characteristics they assign to God are not uniform, because there's nothing uniform about voodoo practices. Some people who emphasize the female you know, nature of God, which reflects the strong Dahomean root. Others who talk about God in terms of male, which could reflect the Catholic you know, um, uh, influence on the, on the tradition. The consensus, however, is that these um, lowest are agents of, uh, of God. Um, some people will emphasize that they are children, the children of God, which also resonates with the Dahomean you know, um, tradition. But then uh, they are cast just as agents who all um, uh, cooperate you know, with the um, supreme being or God. In terms of theory, uh, in the theoretical terms, the sense is that the power that they use comes from, from God. But then uh, that's just in theory. Uh, in practice, the sense you get is that they, play, uh, they place a lot of emphasis on the lowers because they are immediate. So if you don't press them hard, you don't really even get a sense that they believe this, you know, a supreme being who grants the lowest, you know, um, powers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our four speakers and to this audience. And I hope that we can see each other next year in one of these uh, meetings around migrants' religions. Thank you very much.